Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived. This is after Jesus uh, resurrected him from the dead. Jesus comes to his, his town again and it says, um, here a dinner was given by Mary and Martha and Lazarus in Jesus' honor. So the very place where death had been defeated, where a dead dude was brought to life miraculously by the word of Jesus, where a family was brought back together by the power of Jesus and his healing virtue and power and authority over death. In that whole celebration, which you can imagine there'd be a lot, imagine if I could say, hey, today you get a, get a pick of a family member that's going to be back from the dead. Would you like that? <laughs> it might be a, a good celebration, right? Yes. You might throw a feast. <laughs> I mean, when good things happen, we eat, right? I mean, that's it's Bible. And it was Bible there. And it says that in Jesus' honor. So the family wanted to bring together people to feast and eat and drink and celebrate life. And not only life, but the one who gave life. It wasn't a celebration that Lazarus had a new birthday, even though that was true. 
It was a celebration of the one who gave him life. And that's the church. That's the table. That's the remembrance. We come to remember how we have been brought to life. That Jesus made these dead people alive. We do it in his honor. Meaning he's the only one that could have rescued you and me from where we were at. Yeah. This table isn't a message about us. It's a message about Christ. Yeah. And the bread and the drink are our participation in that. Our stories and his stories blended just as much as this food and this drink become part of me. That's a beautiful, a sacred, and a holy thing that we celebrate. And it was in light of that that Paul said to the Corinthian church in chapter 11, he says, For I received from the Lord what I am passing on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if Christ is the message and the invitation and the opportunity, that's a welcome. That's an invitation to him. Keep Christ on your mind. You may come to this table and you're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about your sins. You're thinking about your worthiness. You're thinking about can I, should I? People said this. Churches say that. Jesus said, think about me. This table's about me. Come to me if you're hungry and thirsty. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. When you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we do so this morning. In your name, we eat and drink together. Thank you, Lord. Bless us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Kids, you are dismissed. Folks, you can uh, do your quick bathroom break. Say hello to a few people. Empty your cups, whatever you need to do. And then we're going to get into the scripture after a few announcements in just a moment. <clears throat> yeah. And we'll be doing the offering, uh, Dale, if you got that ready. Yeah. So if you want to get ready for the offering, thank you for that. Um, I'm a little behind. I was supposed to have a video. Nick Blauer, my nephew, uh, gave us a video. I posted it on uh, Realm. So if you haven't seen that, I want you to because some folks gave him some money and did some good stuff with him in Vermont. Readers, I will be using you in the service, so don't lose your papers when you get up and move around either. Let's take our phones, if you have your phones, and put them on silent. That's English for quiet. Father, bless this offering, everything that goes to, everyone that gives, everybody that can, can't, trying, struggling, wrestling, looking for jobs, celebrating good paychecks, whatever it is, God, we come and worship in this offering, Lord. We give liberally, generously, without compulsion. We come, Father, in our hearts, out of obedience, Lord, not to law, but to love. And in the spirit of that, God, bless it, multiply it, and send it to the people that need it, we pray in Jesus' name name. Amen. Thank you for that. Take that offering up and we'll
Uh, had some good outreaches. So on Tuesday night, we were at the men's shelter at UGM, preaching the gospel, serving food, eating with guys, and doing ministry, and a number of people respond. Had a good group this morning, brought five from the shelter this morning. Glad to have you men. Glad you're here. Walked out of the shelter, and as I was walking out, I ran right into a branch in my eye. I was like, I can't believe it. I stuck myself with a branch. I mean, I thought for sure I was going to have to wear a patch and be one eye by right now. But thank God nothing happened. I must have closed it just in time, but it hurt for a few days. Uh, Tyler Bailey was like, Are you okay? <laughs> but we had a good, good service. Uh, Thursday night, we were at the uh, shelter for women, the crisis shelter. Uh, just to explain to those who asked, we had uh, somehow the administration folks in charge scheduled another church's group on our night, uh, a new group, a group that traveled all the way from Post Falls, a big, a big uh, horde of them came. So they were really excited and traveled a ways, and so we just tapped out and yeah. let them have the, have the service and, and to do it, and we'd figure out you know, the scheduling conflict after that. So that we did, those of you who saw us and that didn't see us, we didn't run away. We just, we're, we kind of did a, hey, tag, you're in the ring, and, and they, they wrestled the, the devil that night. So that's why we were not there, but we were there as well. Um, yeah, so that's that. Announcements, every regular stuff's on the screen and online. There's nothing, no outreaches this week, but all the classes are regulars, except for Tuesday night. There's no, this no, week there is, yes. oh, it is this week. We didn't have last week. All right, I'm a week behind. Sorry. <laughs> pay attention, pay attention. Right. I'm going to read a couple verses out of John chapter 11 today, and then we're going to go where God leads in the storm. John chapter 11, verses 21 and 27 on the slide says, it says, this is the same part, this is Killing Lazarus part two. If you didn't hear Killing Lazarus part one, that's up on our YouTube page and our Facebook page. You can watch it there. This is in a, a part two to that sermon. So we're right in the flow of Lazarus getting resurrected. And this is the passage we're going to, a couple passages we're going to look at. Lord Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. That theological thing that you believe, that doctrine, that truth, that future event, I am that. This is the thing that Christians often fail to grasp, that the truth is Jesus. All the truth. He is it. And however it manifests and unfolds, he holds it all together and he's the author and he's the source. The gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't just learn things about God, we follow him in the person of Jesus. We don't just worship the truth about God and learn the truth of God, we follow the truth, the way, the life, who is Jesus. This is a life we're invited into, not just a set of beliefs that we wrestle with people and try to convince them to, to yield to and tap out if we're the better arguer. This is an invitation to meet the man, the God-man, the person, the God in the flesh, one Jesus, the resurrected Son of God. We, we and our message is about him. Church has become a lot of things in its thousands of year history. It's amazing how often you can spend a lot of time in it and forget that it revolves around him. We do a lot for God, but don't have a lot of time in him and with him and for him. And it can become about so many things that we get burned out on and lose enthusiasm about. But when it is him who is the center, everything you need to do what he calls you to do is there because he's the giver of life. <clears throat> Jesus says, the one who believes in me will live. 
So that's our hope. If you, if we ask you to put your faith in Christ, follow Christ, believe Christ, you're going to live. And that word live means all of the most beautiful things it could mean. Deep, meaningful life. Not always easy, not always the best. Doesn't mean you're always gonna have money in your account. Doesn't mean you're always gonna be healthy, wealthy, and wise, and good looking, and no wrinkles on your face. But it does mean you will live in all the ways that God says living matters. He says, you believe in me, you will live. Even though, I, even though they die, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? He said to Martha. She says, yes, Lord. She replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. That's, that's a good confession by a believing woman. Heard it, believe it, settled. Pretty amazing as she said that with the loss of her brother and sorrow and grief and mourning and unknown questions about why Jesus didn't show up on time to save the whole situation. Even in the midst of all that drama, trauma and struggle, she was able to hear Christ, confess Christ and hold to him in light of all that going on in the moment. John chapter 11, verses 38 through 44, uh, has another part of this story. I'm skipping over the time where Jesus, he uh, calls Mary, she comes, they cry together. There's all kinds of beautiful things in this, but I'm gonna focus on another part. 38 through 44 says, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to Lazarus' tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Just like the one coming up on Easter. <laughs> this is a preview of what is to come for everyone. Jesus practices the gospel before the very thing unfolds a few days down the road. We get a picture of what is to come. And it's a beautiful one. Isn't it great that Jesus wanted us to know everything that he's going to do is going to happen to you too because he's going to call you out of the grave. It's a beautiful thing. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave, stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, Martha said, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, or as someone in the chapel Tuesday night said, he stinketh, say the King James. <laughs> he stinketh. Yeah, death stinks, definitely. For he's been there four days, Martha said. Then Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I knew that you, I know that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus coming out. And the dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Happens all the time. Jesus is still doing this in, in all of our lives in various degrees, in radical ways, in slow ways. Jesus is at the tombs of humanity calling people out of the dead, out of the graves, calling you by name. I hope you can hear him. When we go in any outreach and at every pulpit time here, we're, we're in the same spirit of that. Jesus, call your people to yourself. Call them up and out of death. Let dead people live. Dead marriages, dead relationships, dead hopes, dead dreams, dead freedom. Let Everything that's dead and touched by death, everything that stinks, everything that has an odor of decay, everything that smells like it's ready to be buried, Lord, anything that has death, hands and fingers and claws in it, we pray that it would be released in Jesus' name and that life, resurrection life would flow into people and that they would believe and come to life and live in Jesus' name. That's the spirit. We pray over our children. We pray over one another. We pray over everyone we're reaching and loving. We pray over every child and adult. Jesus, let them live for your glory. Amen? Amen. It's been a bit of process. You've got to unwrap things that have been dead. 
right, ladies and men that are in programs? You're doing a lot of that right now. You're going back and all kinds of work. And you're alive and you've touched life and life's touched you. But there's still this process of getting the old all taken off and buried and walk in newness of life. It's called discipleship. It's called sanctification. It's called Christian growth. All kinds of titles. It's us all unwrapping the trappings of the old life, the old man and woman, the old habits, the old mind that needs to be renewed. That's why we study scripture, engage in prayer and fellowship, serve people, love people, um, you know, listen to God's direction for our lives because we're all learning to walk in this new life that God's given us. Sometimes we're stumbling and we're getting the old clothes on sometimes in a weird way. Sometimes we relapse, sometimes we struggle, but it's all the same work. All of you are involved in this in some capacity, some high drama, some low drama, some really intent and focused and going for it, others kind of just, eh. We're all in the mix. <clears throat> but when we gather, we gather to celebrate what Jesus has done. This is in his honor, in his name. It's not about Eric, it's not about Jacob's well, it's not about Luther or Calvin or Swingley or, or um, the Pope or, or who's a Methodist, Wesley or, it's not about Amy Simple, McPherson, Forrest, I'm just trying to think of all the superheroes <laughs> and all the their great people that everybody gathers around. It's not about any of them, those are all great people, they've done things, sown and worked and God's blessed them. But it's about Jesus. And we come to this place, to this house, to honor Jesus. This is a, a place to just hear his name, to sing him praise, to recommit and dedicate our lives to follow him. It's to remember and to, to, in, to be taught of his riches and his glories and to be reunited with him or, or refocused on him or to have our hearts renewed and to find our first love for him again. All of these things are taking place here by the word and the spirit and our ministry to one another. Because death is always at our heels and we never know when we're gonna die. We never know when death's gonna come. We celebrated last week and I told this sad story of the, you know, Nick Pinkerton out at Adult Teen Challenge who, you know, had been sober two years and then he used one time and he overdosed and he died a couple Mondays ago. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we were at Adult and Teen Challenge, a couple Wednesdays ago, and I held a candlelight vigil for Nick there with the men and taught him on grief and mourning and created space to do that. And one of the staff members, uh, Doug, who was a graduate of the program and now a staff member there, a student staff, uh, he leads everything and he leads, he's the one the chapel, in the chapel there, the staff member. Uh, he had a heart attack this week and died. Oh, was fine. Had a heart attack, now he's dead. So this grieving community of men that are wrestling over the overdose and the death of one of their friends and graduates now, this week is grieving and mourning over the loss of one of their mentors, one of their success stories. One of the men who didn't die from relapse, didn't die from using drugs, died serving Jesus, worshiping God, and serving the men of that program. Quite a different story to celebrate, but also a grieving one. And it's in light of that, uh, that we honor Doug this morning and I have a little candle here. Uh, I was gonna ask if, um, uh, let's retrieve my brain here. Robert, would you come up and light the candle for Doug? Robert was um, in the program back then with Doug when they both were going through and they were very close at a period of time and I thought, It'd be a good honor for you to light the candle for Doug as we say a few things about him this morning. The light one there, yeah. I want to take a picture of it. Is that okay, Robert, if I do that? Yes. Yeah, can you get that? You gotta kind of gotta click it and the, yeah. yeah. Yep. I want to get just Robert so I'm not getting anybody else in the picture. Thank you. 
first thing I thought, well, not the first thing, but I had a few thoughts after I got the message from one of the students at Adult Teen Challenge that Doug had died. I thought about Robert, who was his close friend. And I thought, you know, Robert said, in the program at UGM now, and I thought, how's he gonna take this? I need to go, I need to go be with him and help him process the loss of his friend. When you're struggling to get out of stuff and bad things happen, it's easy to just like wanna medicate and go back to what you know makes you feel good for a moment. And what does the church do? We gather around one another like good blood cells when there's a wound and we right. come close and we do what Steve says, we, we help one another, we pray, we share the pain, the difficulty. That's what it means to be the body of Christ. <clears throat> so we sat there in the day room yesterday, praying together, remembering, grateful and, and at the same time sad, but so amazed how one week I was, we were celebrating one sorrow, one way, and this week we're celebrating and sorrowing the same but differently. And Lord God, I pray that we would have more life. And even if bad things happen, that they would happen to those who are doing all they can to go in the right direction. Right. To, you know, swing in until you're taken out. Swing in until your body gives up. Swing in until you don't have anything left and it's your last swing. That's glorious. And I honor Doug that he was fighting the good fight right until the day God's determined in his life it's over. <clears throat> you know, but as a pastor and as a man, I was wrestling through this this week as I'm thinking about Nazareth, thinking about things that were dead coming to life, thanking Jesus that we're going to see him again in eternity, but still wrestling. <clears throat> and yesterday, you know, I was like, oh, God, Saturday before Sunday, come on. I need to keep my head straight, you know, so we're going through all that. I came back from being with Robert, and I walked in, uh, into my living room, and my living room overlooks an area where I keep bees. I've never had a hive that makes it through the winter Thanks. in three years. They all, all died. This was my last attempt to try to be a beekeeper. I was like, this is it. This is last year. I can't handle the sorrow, the tragedy, the trauma, the expense. It's like, maybe this is, maybe it's just too hard to grow bees or I'm too dumb. Something's not working. This is it. And I have watched that last high of all winter sitting hoping nothing's going to destroy it, all the cold weather, the snow. I've sat this week as it started to warm up, and I was like, oh, I saw a, a, me and my granddaughter were, were, went out to clean up um, some of the mess around the hive, and we're, we're there, and she's digging out some of the dead bees that have died, and one little one flew out a couple weeks ago, and I'm like, oh, life! <laughs> but I know that just one doesn't mean the whole hive's alive, so I'm just like, Maybe. And then a couple days ago, it started to warm up a little bit, and the sun came through and warmed that hive a little bit, and I was like, oh, and I'm staring, looking at the little opening, like, come out, little bees. <laughs> Nobody was coming out. Then day before yesterday, I looked, and there was this little bee on the ground, kind of like half hobbling, like he wasn't doing too well. And I'm like, oh, God. That doesn't look like a healthy bee. <laughs> so I'm, I mean, to be honest, and then and that was two days ago. And then the day yes, the day before yesterday, it was three days ago. The day yet before that, I looked and I looked, no signs. And I'm just like, oh man, it's warm enough for bees to be coming out. Yeah. I came back from the shelter yesterday, and they were just all out, swarming in the air, alive, living. And it just felt like a gift from God to me. Just like what has been, what I thought was dead, what has always died. In a moment, people can die, but in a moment, life can spring out. And man, I just reveled in that picture. In the spirit of everything that I've been in. And it was an act of just worship. 
that God is the God of life. And I was encouraged by that. <clears throat> Amen? Yeah. I want to read something in honor of Doug. It's written in a book called the Exeter Book. It's from a town in England, specifically from a cathedral in England, one of the oldest cathedrals in Europe. Uh, I think it's one of, it's definitely the biggest one uh, inside in Europe, in England. And there's a book that was given to that cathedral by a bishop in the early 11th century. And it was a book called the Exeter Book, the book of old English poetry and story. It's basically four books together that we still have, and it's the only place we have the ancient Anglo-Saxon poetry. It's only in these books, and they're in three different cathedrals, in <coughs> one government place, you can go online and look at the Exeter book digitally. I have a copy of it here. What's funny is the book itself, the main one that we're going to read from, uh, obviously has been around a long time and has been used for all kinds of things like a cutting board, like someone put ale upon it one time. It's got all the remnants of someone that didn't always cherish this book in the way it should be cherished but it contains the only writings we have of the Middle Ages poetry and Christian writings of that time of this character. There's only these writings and people at different times. The back end of the book is burned, like someone put a hot poker into it and tried to burn it. I mean, it's so odd that this material, this is the material that we get the book Beowulf from. It's in one of the four, it's like in the fourth book. It's the only, it's where it's, it's extant, we have it. But it's not like you can go to some library and find all these writings. We just had a handful of a witness, thousand years ago material, and we can buy it and, and have it in our library. So this is my copy of some of the material that's in the Exeter book, a bunch of poetries and readings and funeral stuff and Christian musings, it's all amazing and rich. This is the stuff with the wanderer and the seafarer where Tolkien was inspired for different elements of his fantasy work. You can have this writing in your own hands because someone didn't fully burn it, spill their beer on it, or destroy it cutting up their cabbages. It's so strange. I'll post a video of the actual cathedral you can go to today and see it. It's a pretty amazing video. But in this book, there's a, po a poem called The Seafarer. Bring up the Viking guy. <clears throat> and in this poem, at the end of it, there's a prayer. And I wanted to read this prayer uh, in honor of, in memory of Doug. I love one of the things that the, the editor of this book said in his introduction to this book. He said, I must reemphasize that if Old English verse is rich and formal, it inherits its, these qualities from ritual language of the time. The vocabulary and the technique of oral composition comes down from times, and this is the important part, when poetry was mantic, it's a word that's important, and used for magical purposes. When it played, an in, it was a time when poetry played an inseparable part in the rituals of that time that would introduce, celebrate, and interpret the life events and seasons of people's lifetimes. Poetry in the Middle Ages had a quality about it that was involved in the ritual of life. The poet wasn't some beatnik, hippie type friends dude who's writing about his emotions and his acid trip alone the poets were the poets were meant they were they were the voice of the community they were the one that told our story they're the ones that took everything that mattered and put it to song and word and all of the community valued the voice of the of the the poet or the scald or the scribe or the priest that did this 
we use rituals and words to mark moments in our lives. We come together to hear things that were worth hearing from people that could write or sing something that would move us and instruct us and help us process what we are going through. They, were, they used all kinds of forms to somehow get through our minds and our defenses through story and beasts and wars and amazing things and otherworldly things. All to try to awaken to us what is true, what is valuable, and what we all share as people trying to make it through this life. This selection is called or this selection is from one of those poems called The Seafarer. And I read it in honor of Doug, a piece of writing. It says, great is the terrible power of God before which the earth shall turn aside. He established the firm foundations and the expanse of the earth and the heavens above. Foolish is the man who does not fear his Lord. Death, come, death shall come upon him unprepared. Blessed is the man who lives in trust. Grace shall come to him from the heavens. The Lord shall confirm that spirit in him, for he believes in his might. A man should manage a headstrong spirit and keep it in its place, and to be true to men fair in his dealings. He should treat every man with measure and restrain intimacy towards friends and foe. He may not wish his cherished friend to be given over to the fire, not to be burnt on the pyre, yet doom is stronger and God is mightier than any man's conception. Where's my heart? Pardon me. And I have lost my last heart. Wait a minute, I have to look right here. Let us think where it is that we may find a home, and then consider how we may come thither. And then indeed we may strive so that we may be able to enter into the everlasting blessedness where all life is in the Lord's love, the bliss of heaven. Thanks be to the Holy One, therefore, the Prince of Glory, the everlasting Lord, that he has raised us up forever. Amen. We're all on a journey. We don't know when death may take us. We are like Lazarus. We may be, uh, you know, quickly taken at some point. We may have people that are mourning. We are mourning people right now as well. Oh, there's the piece of it. Good job, Eric. <laughs> When I was thinking about Lazarus and I was thinking about him coming to life, I was thinking about, you know, the fact that Jesus himself was going to descend. Jesus himself said that I, I'm leaving a sign, the sign of Jonah for this generation. The sign of Jonah, the, the, the man who's running from God, throws himself into the sea, the fish swallows him, he's carried deep down into the abyss. Jonah talks about this in chapter 2 of his, his, of his book, where he's wrapped in seaweed in the side of this fish, and he's taken deep down to the very, I love the interpretation, uh, Tolkien does, does the translation for this in the New English Bible, down to the roots of the mountains. And that's where a prayer he offered. He prays to God in heaven from the down in the very depths of hell, the very depths of the ocean. And he turns his heart back to God and prays. Jesus said, there's a sign for this generation. I'm that sign. I'm also going to go into the depths, into death, into the deep, dark places of the afterworld. This is a story that for, for hundreds and hundreds of years in the Greco-Roman world was a part of all fantasy and writings. 
A trip to the underworld was not something new to the Hebrew mind or the time period of Jesus. This was written about in Homer and many other books of the time period. This idea that death somehow needs to be confronted, death is going to be experienced. Death is something that holds people and you can't get out of. All these storylines were a part of the ancient world. But Jesus had this storytelling that was different. I am going to come out. I am going to come out by myself. My own authority. I will raise myself up. I will come out of the grave. This is something that the hero stories don't lean into. You have to be called by another God out of the grave. You've got to be somehow given authority by the powers of the grave and the beasts of the hell to even come out. Most of the ancient stories are stories of people that almost make it out, trying to rescue their wives or whatever, but they die trying. The grave and hell was full of power and authority. No one was more victim of it than humanity, but in the person and gospel of Jesus, Jesus foretells that he will also take the hero's journey. He will go into the depths and darks of the earth, and he will rescue his people. He will bring them out. All of them. Not one lone mythic hero that is able to accomplish something in the fanciful writings of some Greek poet. But all his people will be brought out and he will conquer death, take its gates and tear them asunder, take the keys and eventually will throw hell itself into the everlasting judgment and fire of God. Do away with it. That's how much power Christ has over all that we fear and face in death and the afterlife. And Jesus proclaimed that on earth to his disciples, that they might have hope, they might have faith. And then he said, you are also going to be risen from the dead. I will call your name and bring you and your body up to life eternal or life in judgment, whatever it may be, depending on where your faith is or your belief. Whether you call him Lord, this is the message of these stories. And he did it for Lazarus. Poor guy didn't get to go hang out with anybody. He probably was just about tipping glasses or having a, a unicorn feast or something there on some, you know, with the people he all thought were important. And then all of a sudden, someone was sorry, a, a check for Lazarus. You have a return ticket. That must have sucked, you know? You know? You're like, all right. Finally done with this. A long sick bed. Oh, how about going back for a second round? He's like, he's like, who's praying for that? Don't pray for me to come back. Stop praying, Mary. <laughs> C.S. Lewis has some great lines about that when he's writing in a grief observed where he's talking about the, the death of his uh, of his wife and He's talk, he wrestles with the fact, like, would she want me even to be praying for her to, you know, he's like, I, she wants me, she wants to go. She's done. And I'm sitting here trying to drag her back to this thing. Lazarus was brought back to, though, he was an evidence and a sign of what was to come. What a hope it is to see that. We also know that when Jesus was resurrected, as we'll see in the Easter week when we, when we talk about this, other people were resurrected from graves. When Christ on the cross, when, it, when, the, when he died, the ground shook and rocks opened up and dead people came alive and hung out in their graves until Easter morning. Resurrection Sunday. And then on Resurrection Sunday, Sunday, a whole bunch of them just went into town to celebrate with their families. Imagine that. When Jesus, when Jesus and his power is brought in, when he is brought into his resurrection life and power, it's so powerful it empties grave, graveyards ahead of time. That's how powerful his life is. It, earth can't help, help but give up its dead prematurely when Christ stands in his resurrection power. Death yields to Christ in his power, in his purposes. All that he wills bends the universe to his will. 
And it can do nothing but give up. And that is so true in him simply calling a dead man out of the grave or dead people rising or in the book of Revelation, as we'll see, all of earth will stand before him. That's how powerful his life is. Maybe you've been in a dark place where you have been hopeless and felt in desperate need of life. Maybe you've given hope up help. Maybe you've given up hope on your spouse. You don't see them changing. They're as dead as a doornail. They have no sympathy, no compassion. They can't talk. They don't understand their heart. They don't understand their own soul. You suffer in their presence because you can't connect. And you wonder if life is ever going to find its way back into this relationship. Maybe you wonder if anything can change. You're wrestling with children or their futures or home issues and you just see a bent and a way of being and you don't know how to change them. You don't know how to respond to them. You don't know how to make them be the person you want them to be. They're growing and you can't seem to make the branches go this way. It just seems like life is taking on a direction and a form that you're not quite sure about and you're worried about and you're watching this young child grow into a teenager and there's fruit on there that's wonderful and some stuff really stinks and you're not quite sure how life is going to look. You're praying, God, lead them, direct them, shape them, give them the desires that are good, protect them from this crazy world that's mad. You're praying scripture, you're reading the Bible, you're doing worship songs, you're just thinking everything you can do, get them to church, go to this program. You're just sure that everything depends on whether or not you do the right thing as a parent. If I just don't fail, if I don't drop the ball, if I have the right words to say, read the right books, say the right prayers, confess all my sins, if I just orchestrate everything and make sure there's sourdough bread and, and, and the right programming and no Netflix and they're on their phone the right amount of time, and if I orchestrate everything, then maybe life will happen, right? What a burden that can be upon the soul of a parent. Lead a man or a woman to drink. <laughs> to just give up. To feel like, I don't have any answers. <clears throat> and then when tragedy strikes and sorrow strikes and people do make decisions and people leave you, cheat on you, or you yourself burn your own house down by your own de de deception or wrong choices and you can't commit to the good person you know you're supposed to be and you yourself just let things fall apart and you realize you don't even have much power to do good even if you want to do good. You're a victim of your own powerlessness and your own sinfulness and you wonder how God can do anything with your pitiful life choices. You yourself wonder if life is powerful enough to give you change. David felt these things. He felt like he was in deep, deep need of rescue. And he looked at the old stories and he thought of the, the story of Moses and God coming down in fire and leading God's people through the Red Sea. He, David thought about the sea opening up and God just making a way where people didn't believe there was a way where people were going to be killed by Pharaoh and the Egyptians and they're on the edge of the sea and there's no hope and there's no rescue and then God in his power and spirit moves and in fire into the water and splits it apart so that his people can move through. And David's, David, in his own desperation, is thinking about his own life and his own situation, and he's reimagining that rescue. And he says it in Psalms 18, in one of the most beautiful passages that grabs all the ancient world's imagery, all the picture of beasts and dragons, all the images of being rescued, of God coming down from the heavens to, to save us. And he begins to write about that. So in Psalms 18, I have a number of readers. Who's got the first portion of Psalm 18? There's a one on it. I'll have you read that first. Go ahead from where you're at. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. 
a cry came before him into his ears. Yeah. The earth trembled and quaked, and the foundations of the mountains shook. They trembled because he was angry. Smoke rose from his nostrils. <coughs> Soon fire came from his mouth. Burning coal blazed out of it. Number two. He parted the heavens and came down. Dark clouds were under his feet. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared in on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him. The dark rain clouds of the sky. Number three. Out of the brightness of his presence, clouds advanced. With hailstones and bolts of lightning, the Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded. He shot his arrows and scattered the enemy with great bolts of lightning. He routed them. The valleys of the sea were exposed, and the foundations of the earth lay bare at your rebuke, Lord, at the blast of breath from your nostrils. <coughs> Number four. Please. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. You, Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. Next one. Five, I think. Yeah. With your help, I can advance against the truth. With my God, I can scale the wall. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You make your saving help a shield. And your right hand sustains me. Your help has made me great. Provide a broad path for my feet so that my ankles do not give away. Is that beautiful? Yeah. What a picture of you and I being rescued by God and then given the power to do things that in ourselves we would have never been able to do. To strengthen your ankles so that you won't slip, you won't slide, you won't stumble. He gives you strength to climb a wall. Whatever's in front of you that seems too high for you to get over, that you can't reach, that seems a barrier to where you're at. David says, God has given me. He has rescued me. And it's beautiful to be rescued in all the ways that he says. But then he says, that rescue has now empowered me to do things I couldn't do before by his power and grace. God doesn't just save us. He then empowers us by his spirit of life. He not only rescues us and cleanses us and forgives us and sets us up in righteousness, but he then empowers us and fills us with his spirit that we may be able to run and fight and live this life he's given us. That's the hope and promises of God. Not just to pick you out, but then to uphold you. To uphold you. Psalm 74, 12 through 14 says, somebody has that out there. Yet God, my king, is from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. Mm -hmm. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. All the ancient stories have sea serpents in the, in the waters. And David <coughs> speaks of a God who is the, who is the all the anti-heroes speak of. The God who himself comes down into the chaos and defeats the dragons. Defeats the sea monsters. All that deep, dark fear you have when you look in the deep waters over the boat's edge or when you're swimming somewhere, if you're that brave, and you're looking down into those deep places that you can't see something down there, you just know that in every deep place, there's got to be something that wants to eat you, right? There's just something in the human consciousness that when you can't touch, you're done, right? As soon as your feet are walking, you're not on the ground. It's like, I know I am now going to be a victim. That is just something within us. It doesn't matter if it's a pool, you're sure there's a shark in the pool, right? If you're, you know, Xers or a little before that, you're sure that, right? Your old childhood was ruined by Jaws. Now you can't even sit in a floaty in the deep end of a pool without like checking it out, right? We just have that fear within us. Be 
Because it is a real fear. There are dragons. There are Leviathan. There are dark things. Yeah. There are beasts in the netherworld. There is evil. Yeah. And all of our imaginings are not based on fantasy. They're based mm -hmm. on dark, true, spiritual reality. Right. But the Bible, God's word to us, gives us hope mm -hmm. that there's one greater. Amen. There's one more powerful. Yeah. And he tells all the same stories, but he's the victor. And he's the one in whom to put your hope. What Leviathan has its teeth and claws in you? What, what has grasped you in the thoughts and recesses of your mind and memory? In the formation of who you are as a person and your identity? Where has evil bit you? Where has it sunk its intentions and its purposes into your life and warped and shaped you by its evil intentions? That is the victory and the place that God in his power wants to come to. He's a rescuer that takes the jaws of death and opens them and releases victims. He goes to where teeth and claw has penetrated and wounded and where the poison of evil has found its way into your bloodstream and your thought life and corrupted your very nature. Jesus, by his divine nature, makes you a partaker of his divine nature and purifies and heals and cleanses the inner man. That is the power of resurrection life. Now, and Jesus said, I am the resurrection Right now, it's not all about a day to come. If I speak it, it will happen in your life in some capacity and meaningful way. You will live now. And that's why I want to hear the voice of God. That's why I want to read his word. That's why I want these words to find voice in my mouth, in prayer, in song, in poetry. I recant and retell and sing and speak and whisper and pray and shout and memorize and write the words of God. Because Jesus is the word made flesh. Reality, not just hope of resurrection, makes resurrection happen in the graveyard and in the home. Yeah. Who do you have your faith in? Isaiah 51, 9 through 11. Someone has that verse out there. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of God. Awake, as in days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces? Who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over? And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee. Away. Every fantasy story, every fairy tale wrapped up in one prophecy from Isaiah. The human heart knows what it wants and longs for, what it yearns for. Angels are dropping their jewelry. Um, <laughs> the human heart, why do you resonate with all these themes? Why do you want to be rescued? Why do you want to be redeemed? Why do you want someone powerful, more powerful to slay the dragon? All of these images, images and pictures and hopes, all of that wrapped up, all that desire that you have when you're weeping, when you're sorrowful, when you're sighing, you know that something within you says this shouldn't be. Right? You know when bad things happen to you and things are difficult, there's something within you that says, this is not the way the God of this ordered universe desires things to be. Something has to change. Something within me says, this is not as it shall be. And that is true because eternity has been written on your heart. You know the end from the beginning. God has put it in you like a prophecy and a seed and a truth. And darkness, as hard as it may be, as black as it may be, in your darkest, sighing, weeping moment, hope 
and truth and faith will resonate within the deepest place of you, saved or not, and it will cry out and say, you are not created for this realm and this reality. God has created you for himself and for his purposes and for eternity. And he's coming to get you, to rescue you, to return to you. And the church says, Amen. <coughs> Amen. Is that good news for anybody in me? I want singing. Everlasting joy be upon my heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and seeing are going to flee away. <laughs> what a beautiful picture. Go away. <sighs> Run away. <laughs> The great God who steps into your life and causes sighing and sorrow to flee. Yes, please. To flee. Who doesn't want to run to that God? Run to Jesus. Run to his care and his arms and his kingdom and his kingship and his throne and his power. Run to him. Cry for him. Shout for him. Plead with him. Pray to him. That is, that is what your hope resides in. And I don't care if the darkest thing with the most vicious visage and, and face stares you down and threatens you with its breath of death and its claws and its talons and its lies and its evil. I don't care how hot its breath feels upon you. It is in that moment that you are to call upon the name of Jesus, the one who has conquered death hell and the grave. Call for him to rescue you. And he promises anyone who puts their hope in me will not be disappointed. That's a whole life promise. That means no matter what comes, at some moment when you divvy it up with God, it will have been worth it. When you stand before him face to face and you lay every card on the table and wonder about everything that went down, his promise to you is you will not be disappointed. That might be hard right now where you're at to believe. I pray that you hear the truth of this in your soul. Because it is truth, as true as the old King James says, Verily, verily. <laughs> Amen. <sighs> Let's pray. Let's stand together. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you for your rescue. Some of us have already tasted it, but we need fresh, fresh work and move of your your power your resurrection power and life in every very cracks of our lives lord our cathedrals are full of areas lord that you still need to move into our homes and hearts and lives and relationships we invite you jesus to do your work among us there's still dragons there's still beasts that are in need of slaying God, we come to you to be the God who's more powerful and able than all of these things. Lord, that you fill our hearts with hope and faith and trust. God, we come to you as those who have been beaten down and in need of rescue. We come to you maybe in disappointed and disillusioned hearts where chapters haven't gone the way we think the story should go. And we wonder about the author of this book of our lives and wonder if he knows what he's writing. We wonder why there's been so much drama and trauma or we wonder why it's so boring or why there's not a, a high point or we're tired of just the monotony of chapters and chapters of discussion of stuff that doesn't move us. We are in need, God, of your divine perspective this moment in this place right now. We ask, Lord, that you would look into our hearts and our minds and speak to us, God, about where we're at. Lord, I call upon you. I know as in the days of old, you're the same God today as you have ever been. You're still the God of fire and rescue and power and compassion and love. You still are filled with all the animating reality that David had. You sit there in lightning and thunder and smoke and darkness 
and you are coming in that same intentions for us, Lord. Some people in this room don't think you care about them, God. I pray that you rip open the heavens and come down in their lives, that you would show them, Jesus, that you're the God that can rescue them out of the pit of their own hell, however private or public it may be, that, Jesus, you would draw them up in the resurrection power of Christ. Call their name like you called Lazarus's name, Jesus. Let them have a feast in their house in honor and remembrance of your great work in their home and their children and in their lives, God. I pray that this house would be a house of singing, a house of joy, that you would chase off, Father, sighing and weeping and sorrow and bring back song, Father, I pray, in the lives of your people. <clears throat> and God, we trust you because it's not about our power. <laughs> it's not about how good we can figure this out. I'm crawling to you, Jesus, in hopes that you will meet me in this moment. I come to your table, Jesus. I pray you minister to your sons and daughters right now, God. And if you have been moved by the truth of this, reach out to him. Call upon him in the quiet of your heart and the tears that you shed and the verses that you cling to in the memory of older days. Watch your movies, read your books and know that all those threads that tug upon your heart are God's voice to you. He's speaking hope, faith, trust, love, freedom, healing, and joy. You will not be disappointed. Father, I pray as we go that you would bless each person's life that these truths would find them in the rest of this day and in their own time before you, God, that you would sing over them, speak over them, minister to them, that when they talk together, they would encourage one another in the Lord of the great God who is saving them. And may we be a people that testify to this world that Christ is victorious over all, I pray. In Jesus' name, the church said, Amen. Amen. Amen.